So today I want to talk about three concepts, sex, gender, and human sexuality. We'll start with sex. When anthropologists talk about sex, they are referring to the biological or genetic differences between males and females, and we're used to thinking of sex in this way as a binary system. So we learn in high school biology class that women have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y chromosomes, males and females. It's very simple, right? And this is an X and a Y chromosome. This is clearly a male. Well, it's actually a bit more complicated than that, as somewhere around 1% of all humans don't fall neatly into the categories of male and female, and may have sexual organs or genitalia that are somewhat ambiguous, mixed, underdeveloped, or that don't match the individual's outward expression of sex. Anthropologists sometimes combine all these individuals in, into one category called intersex, meaning between the sexes. Putting all these people into one category, though, is definitely oversimplifying things, as there are dozens of conditions that can produce an intersex individual. This woman, for example, is named Castor Semenya, and she was the winner of the 800-meter run in the 2009 World Championships. Um, after several women raised suspicions about Semenya's sexual identity, she submitted herself to a number of rounds of tests and screenings carried out by a team of doctors and geneticists. The, result of the results of these tests were intended to be kept secret, but were later leaked online. The report suggested that Semenya had the external genitalia of a female, but instead of ovaries, she possessed internal testes. This was likely the result of something called androgen insensitivity syndrome, where the body fails to take on male sexual characteristics because of an insensitivity to the male hormone androgen. Semenya would later return to competition, and it's widely believed that she had these internal testes removed. Removing these internal testes would not only lower her body's production of testosterone that no doubt contributed to her muscular development here, it also uh, is highly recommended to do so as people with internal testes will often develop cancer uh, later on in life, testicular cancer. So sex refers to biological differences between males and females, but we know that there are more than two categories, even from a purely biological standpoint. This is somewhat of a taboo topic in Western culture and historically has read, led to some rather poor decisions on the part of uh, the medical establishment. Doctors today are far more cautious than they were previously when it came to making a decision about sexual assignment at birth, since making an error can have a, serious, can have a set of serious consequences for the child later on in life. So what then is gender? Okay, Gender refers to what we learn about what it means to be male or female. Gender is performative, it's socially constructed. Uh, we are born male and female, but we have to learn how to be men and women. As we grow up, we accumulate knowledge about these cultural codes that govern our behavior. If you grew up in Southwest Virginia as a male, you were probably expected to do certain things like wear pants and a shirt, boots or sneakers, learn how to hunt or to work on cars, play football, and so on. And these activities and modes of dress are associated with notions of masculinity, uh, though it should be said that plenty of women hunt and fish and work on cars and wear boots and jeans and so on. Even so, gender differences are present. Women will wear jeans and boots, but not exactly the same kind of boots and jeans. And most, uh, but not all, men in this area choose not to wear tights, sweatshirts, and knee-high boots as casual dress like this, right? Uh, as this would be going against the grain of the cultural codes that govern normative uh, gender performance. It should be remembered, however, that these modes of dress are really very arbitrary. Prior to the 1950s or 60s, a woman wearing pants on campus might have been, been considered as very transgressive. This is a picture um, of Radford's class of 1937, I believe. Uh, but anyway, wearing pants today is seen as completely normal. And of course, these codes vary widely from culture to culture around the world. I mean, in South Asia, where it may wear sarong skirts, and of course, the Scots have traditionally worn kilts, at least on occasion. And in both of these examples, these modes of dress are associated with masculinity, with a masculine gender identity. Okay. Many cultures also have a long tradition of transgender or third gen gender identities, uh, and of course, this is becoming less taboo in American culture as well. Many Native American groups had a third category of gender, sometimes known as a burdash or a two-spirit. This is a, a Zuni burdash. Um, in many of these cases, the two-spirit person is a man who decides to take on the roles uh, and behaviors and dress codes of, of women. 
Uh, in India, there's also the example of the hijra, who often undergo an emasculation rite involving castration. They become eunuchs, in other words. Uh, traditionally, hijras uh, can be called upon to take on special roles in certain Hindu rituals, but today often they make a living uh, by begging or doing uh, sex work. Okay, so sex refers to biological difference, and gender is something that is learned. What about sexual identity? Um, there's, an, there's an enormous amount of variation in cultures worldwide when it comes to sexual activity. Cultures vary greatly in their approaches to male and female homosexuality, in the codes that uh, govern both uh, the, in the codes that govern sex both inside and outside the bonds of marriage, and even with regard to the rules that govern sexual relationships uh, between adults and children. To give you an example of how different these cultural codes regarding sex are, I'll give you the example um, of the Atoro of Papua New Guinea, pictured here. Traditionally, all Atoro men engaged in a kind of ritualized homosexuality with the younger boys of the community so that they might pass on their life force to these young men. The Atoro believed that this was a, this is necessary to grow and to, to develop as a man. Um, for these boys, for these young boys engaging in sexual acts with the older men in the village is a rite of passage. Furthermore, uh, the Atoro believe that heterosexual activity can drain a man of his life force and that homosexual, homosexual activity actually prolongs their lives. And in certain parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan today, uh, men will often engage with sex with young boys, uh, for instance. Uh, interestingly, this is not seen as homosexual behavior in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan, which would run against uh, Islamic law, but it's rather seen as an act of dominance. Okay, so uh, of course in the West, this type of behavior is considered deeply moral and criminal, uh, though of course it still occurs. Um, you know, and I give you these striking, striking examples to illustrate just how different sexual codes may be from one culture to the next. Uh, and of course we should remember that while we may use the tools of cultural relativism to uncover the underlying logic behind some of these practices, it does not mean that we have to accept the morality of such behavior. So there we go, um, sex, gender, and uh, human sexuality.